right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Kaselniak. I am the chair of the safety committee for the Colorado Pilots Association. And we're our special guest tonight is Les Habig from the what they call the NOCO Tower. Les is the air traffic manager at the NOCO Tower at the Northern Colorado, Colorado Regional Airport in Loveland, Colorado, otherwise known as the Colorado Remote Tower Project. Les retired in 2021 from the FAA after 36 years of service. Most of those 36 years were in Alaska. Les did work for eight years from 2006 to 2014 as a controller at the Centennial Tower. Les has a bachelor's degree from the Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University and is also a private pilot. With that, I'd like to introduce Les to everybody. All right, Les, it's all yours. Thank you very much for doing this presentation tonight on the uh, Colorado Remote Tower Project. Hi, nice to meet everybody. <clears throat> so when I saw the first email, the project or the presentation topic that they asked for was to talk about the airspace, the rules and regulations that we are working under when we fly into Fort Collins, and how can we better work when we say we, the pilots, how can the pilots better work within the airspace? Um, what we have is, is quite unique. Um, there's only two facilities uh, like this in the United States, and it is a test facility. Um, so to talk about what we do now, it really helps to talk about what are we trying to do, what has been done in the past. And so let's see how good I am at my Zoom stuff. I'm going to bring up uh, just a basic website. Can you see it? It's just a CDOT website on the Colorado Remote Tower Project. Yep, that came out. Uh, good. So I'm really just going to go to a public website that talks about uh, the project. Some of the data will be um, outdated, but I can talk about some of it. I will say that since this is a test project, uh, every controller at this facility is signed an NDA and there's specifics that we are not allowed to. That's kind of why I feel more comfortable going to a a public website because those are the things we can talk about. Um, so the car remote project started because, um, I mean, the whole concept of of building something that's cheaper than the standard. You know, you build a hundred foot tower, put all the infrastructure with that. It costs millions of dollars to build. Um, this project you could probably put in for hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars. Um, and, and I bring you to this website simply because if you want more information, you can go to it and you can find much more stuff on this than, than I really care to talk about. And you don't want me talking about this for, for a very long time, but it'll give you basics of the project, the airport partners, the technology involved. Um, one thing I'm stealing from right now, uh, or I will on the next screen, is a presentation given by the airport manager. So when I click on that tab, does it change? Does it change to a, I don't know, a timeline, project timeline thing? Do you guys see that? No, it didn't change. Nope. Okay, then let me try. Stop share. Go back to share screen. And I'm gonna have to share it individually each time. So did it change to project timeline? Uh, I think it's still, it says you started. Screen. It's trying to do something. Trying to do something. This might be too slow to do. So anyways, the project has been put, put in place way back since 2014. The remote tower project was, was built in late 19, 2019. And ATC services started at Fort Collins in April of 2020. And it coincided with the remote tower project. Now there's two phrases I'm gonna use that are, they seem similar, but they're very different. There's the mobile tower, and then there's the remote tower. The mobile tower is a trailer and we work uh, air traffic control out of that. It was really only thought of that we would do air traffic control out of that mobile tower for a few months, maybe a year at the most. 
and COVID put everything on hold. And so the FAA said, we're going to continue to keep air traffic control going there just for continuity for when we want to start this project. And last April, March and April, we were able to do phase one of the testing. Um, the FAA asked for some modifications of the system that's being worked on. Uh, so the project, uh, once again, is back on hold. And, and once those modifications are made, we'll probably start back with um, phase one of the testing. So you guys don't see any of this screen scrolling? No. OK, well, I'm going to just stop sharing. Um, let me try one more thing. Share a screen. I'm going to just throw up a picture. Do you see a picture of a trailer? Nope. Les, nope. Think about doing Les, something. Les Habig has started screen sharing. So if you can get a picture up on your screen, it might come up on ours. It is on my screen. Hey. Yeah. Hi, Howard, by the way. Hi, and do you have a webmaster in there anywhere? No, I do not. So then let me just talk about what we got going on. So there is a mobile tower providing air traffic control services, and then there is the uh, hey. uh, the remote tower. I, I got project. the picture of the trailer right now. Okay, Les. there we go. This is what we work air traffic control out of. Um, when we do the testing, let's see if I can bring up another picture. This might take a while. Um, I'm going to share that. No, it's up. You're doing Got great. It. Got it. So this Got all is the what we refer to as the remote tower. Um, around the airport, there are three camera masks um, holding up 31 various cameras. Some are static. They don't move. Um, probably about 10 or 12 of them make what we call that video wall that you see right there. That wall is a is 360 degree view, and it's crunched down to about 180 degrees. It takes time to get at crunch that. Um, then it down below the workstation foreground that what we would consider probably the supervisor's desk to overall see. The left or right can be ground or local, whichever. That's all part of the testing uh, procedures. But each screen, uh, there's point, tilt, and zoom cameras that we can modify if we're on runway 15. Um, there's, a, there's a set of cameras that are near the approach end to 15 that we can, can uh, focus mainly on. If we're on 33, we can go to that mast on 33. Um, the pictures you see on the, on the video wall are center field mast. And um, so the idea is that you we pipe this video into an office area and controllers can work it remotely. Uh, you know, the whole idea of a remote tower, uh, there's some uh, tech geeks there were talking to me. They said the difference between a remote tower and a virtual tower is the remote tower, can they can send that amount of bandwidth a long distance. So in theory, if we could send this bandwidth a long distance, we could put Telluride Airport, we could put Gunnison Airport, we could put you know all a bunch of airports around Colorado and pipe them into a you know some kind of a, a larger building to where they're working four, five, ten smaller airports, and and in theory the putting them in is cheaper, and then staffing them can be cheaper instead of having like Centennial Tower where you have, I know their staffing's down, but when I was there, they had like 28 controllers working. Um, you know, those 28 controllers could be certified on, you know, probably not Centennial because that is a very busy airport, but smaller airports, you could be certified at, at two or three different airports. And instead of working Fort Collins today, they go, hey, we're short staffed at Telluride. Can you work Telluride? It's like, sure. Um, so the, the flexibility uh, down the road can be huge. And I'm really just talking off the top of my head as far as potential. I mean, that's where the potential is, you know. Um, you know, right away, you're saving money on, on um, building a tower. You're saving money on, on infrastructure. 
Um, down the road, you can save money on people, maintenance, a lot of different things. So that's where the concept lies. Um, because of COVID, this project has been pushed back significantly, um, but that's the background. Now, the just of presentation. We are working out of the trailer um, and we don't have radar. We can just see what we can see out the windows. Um, so now it comes down to a pilot who's flying up that's not familiar with Fort Collins. What can, you know, what are the, what are the airspace regulations? What are, you know, what are the, um, you know, and what are the rules and regulations and what can you as a pilot do better? to help us out. So I'm gonna stop sharing and try sharing one more thing. And this is probably gonna be the simplest. So I need to change my screen around first. I'm just gonna bring up, and it might take a little while to, to load, but um, I'm just bringing up a sectional chart. You know? Got it. So we can talk about what's different with Fort Collins. And if you're familiar with the sectional chart, a dashed magenta line means echo surface area. Typically, uh, there's not a lot of echo surface areas with control towers. Um, if, you, if I were to run down to Jeffco or if I run down to Centennial and look at their airspace, you know, I'm familiar with Centennial. It's a blue dashed line for Delta surface area. And then the extension has the magenta dash line, which is echo extension. Um, and, and those have different, different meanings. But for the most part, um, we've got a five mile ring around the airport. It's five nautical miles up to 2,500 feet. Um, if all you do is consider it the same as Delta, that's fine. Um, because in all practical purposes, that's what it is. Echo with tower, when you look up the FARs, kind of means the same thing as, as Delta. <clears throat> so, um, so then the, the first question is, why didn't they change it to Delta? Well, it's by definition, we are a test facility. You know, with that logic, we're, we're temporary. We are not slated to be here permanently unless the test passes. Um, and to change it from echo to delta takes uh, public comment, it takes rulemaking changes, it takes a lot more time than, than you really want to go. And, and there's a lot of avenues for echo with tower. It's super common with um, what they refer to as fire towers. Um, the one, you know, I've worked several fire towers in my FA career, but when I was at Centennial, probably 10 or 12 years ago, there were a lot of fires in Southern Colorado and uh, Durango Airport, they brought in one of these temporary trailers and we worked air traffic control out of Durango. Still stayed echo, but it was notumed with a tower. And so it's echo surface area with a tower. It's, if you look nationwide, there's not many. There might be two others that are somewhat permanent, but it's mostly set up for the temporary fire towers. Um, so uh, we work five mile ring uh, up to 2,500 feet AGL. And, and really anything that I tell you about this is gonna be ATC 101. If I were a controller at Jeffco, if I were a controller at Centennial, I would give you the same talk. How can you help us um, now, one thing that's different from us, us from them, is we don't have radar in our little horse trailer. There's a lot of reasons that we don't. Um, basically, it's just not practical to install it space-wise, equipment-wise. It, it's just not possible, but they're able to put it in the remote tower. So first thing is uh, good position reporting. Um, and I mean, I'm a pilot. I, I fall under the same habits of, of I'm 10 south. What does that mean? You know, 10 south of the airport for me can mean something different to another airport or to another pilot, I mean. Um, you know, we've kind of tried to move towards geographical reporting. And, and we've actually put a uh, graphical note out. And you can see along these in the uh, chart, 
might have zoomed out too much. But we have a lot of these, there's eight of them, um, position uh, reporting points, the little flags. We have like the Budweiser plant, super big plant north of town. We've got Warren Lake. We've got the uh, CSU football stadium. We've got the town of Berthoud. We've got the town of Johns, uh, Johnstown. We've got Johnson's Corner. We've got the town of uh, Severance. I don't know why that flag's not up. Maybe I, I don't know. Oh, I know why. I go to the Denver Tech. Town of Severance is up. Now that I changed a little bit on my screen, do you guys still see the, the VFR chart? Okay, I'm seeing Michael. Mike nod his head. Yeah. Yes. So when we started this, as far as trying to get good position reports, there was a lot, um, and, you know, I don't have exact data, but we do have some to where pilots would call up, say, um, I'm 10 South. We would tell the pilot, proceed straight in runway 33, report a five mile final. And even the difference of what pilots think a straight in is. And so when I talk to the F and L Pilots Association, I'm always throwing all you guys under the bus. I'm going, you know, it's not you guys. It's it's the guys from Jeff Coast, Centennial, Erie, Longmont, you know, those guys that aren't super familiar that they just, you know, and if they're coming up over birth it, we tell them straight in report a five mile final. They they think straight in just means point to the numbers, you know. Well, it's not. In the pilot controller glossary, straight in is synonymous with final, which is being lined up with the extended center line of the runway. So if we say fly to a five mile final, report, you know, turning five mile final, that should be right around here. Well, magically, there's Johnson's Corner, which is a big truck stop. Should be, it's very easy to see from the sky. Uh, five mile final for runway 15 is Warren Lake. Relatively easy. There's a lot of lakes around, but Warren Lake was always depicted on the sectional. All we did was add a flag. So now, even though the controllers don't always do it, um, the, the the phrase we would give is fly to Johnson's Corner for five mile straight and report over Johnson's Corner. Um, same thing for a four on one five, you know, fly to Warren Lake for a straight in runway one five, report over Warren Lake. Um, so the whole idea of geographical reporting um, just really pins it down to where there's a lot of ambiguity to where I'm five east of the airport. I mean, I was just looking at a thing today on on our radar replay. Even though we don't have radar, I have a tool that I can bring up all the radar and, and, and review it. Uh, we had a, a guy come in and said he was five east and he was like over severance, you know, over, you know, it was like, okay, that's not east. That's, you know, that's north, northeast, maybe. Um, you know, not a big deal, but it's it's just like it really helps if we pin down where you're at, especially since, you know, we don't have radar. If you fly into Centennial, you can say I'm over Chatfield Reservoir and really be three south of it. And the tower will look over there and go, I don't see anybody over Chatfield, ident. And they ident and they've got you and they don't care. It's like, fine. But uh, for us, those those uh, position reports are, are real, real important. So a couple things that are out and, you know, letters to airmen, graphical notams. I don't know, and you guys can give me feedback on that. How well are they, um, are they available to you? I can, I can list three letters to airmen right now that, that should be out. One, which amends the, uh, the airport map, which shows the position of the tower on the airport, <laughs> which is north of Charlie, just east of the, the air carrier. The purpose for that is since we're a temporary facility, they're not gonna mark a temporary facility on, on the uh, airport diagram. Um, but if you come in no radio, you should be able to know where to look if you need, if you need a light gun signal. Um, we just put out a new LTA. All runways are, are published left traffic. 
And uh, when we first opened up, uh, the controller is there. We're like, we can't do one five left traffic in the touch and go pattern. We need that everything in front of us. So we started using right traffic. Somebody had realized we hadn't done the correct safety management assessment for that. So we just recently uh, went through that. And now we have a NOTAM fast blast and an LTA out on when the tower is open, you can expect right closed traffic. If you're, if you're in the touch and go pattern, right right traffic for runway one five. Uh, left traffic for three three will still be standard. Um, the other LTA has to do about uh, the reporting points that I'd already talked about, and there isn't a graphical note out on those. Um, so that kind of leads to my other point is, is do you research? Uh, we are still getting pilots who are using an old CTAF frequency that hasn't been active. It's been noted out of out of service three almost almost three years ago. And so we we still keep that keyed up on our on our portable radio. And if we have somebody flying in that's Nordo, guess what? We'll key that up and say, hey, if there's somebody inbound, come up on tower frequency. And more times than not, that person will call us on tower frequency. And it's like, dude, did you not even do your proper pre-brief? It's like, you know, I know the answer is like, I've done this a hundred times. I haven't done it for a couple of years, but I've done it a hundred times. I know how to do it. Well, we would like you to do your research. We would like you to do a proper pre-flight as far as briefings, knowing where you're flying, knowing what NOTAMs are out there, knowing what LTAs are out there. I mean, this is something that every controller is going to tell you. Make sure you're familiar with the airspace that you're flying into. Don't just think you're familiar with the airspace that you're flying into. Um, what else? What else? How am I doing on time? So I've hey, spent about 20 minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, this is Dan Olson. I'm a local pilot based at FNL. And first of all, thank you very much for the tower services you guys have been providing. Sure. Uh, I think well. it's a fantastic uh, step up and improvement from where we've been in the past, and it's an evolution. Um, however, I think the the lack of radar and frankly, just you know, uh, the, the lack of understanding of pilots that the tower does not have radar is a fatality waiting to happen. Um, We've I think it's about, just, yeah, but I think it's kind of an assumption that, you know, uh, from a pilot, you know, cause you're talking to local pilots here tonight. There are so many charter pilots and, and jet pilots and corporate pilots and so on coming in. And when they're talking to radar, there's just an assumption that there is a radar available and, and tower is providing separation. Right. And, and while I'm a local pilot and I know that's not the case. I have very, very nearly been killed twice. The last time was on Labor Day uh, in September this year um, by uh, by a near midair, and uh, and I I would I know we don't have radar, but I want to get the word out to other pilots that we don't have radar. And guess what, pilots, see and avoid. It's still your responsibility. So I'm wondering if we until we have radar. Is there something we can do, like put a just on the ATIS a notice reminding pilots this tower does not have radar, see and avoid separation is your responsibility. So we've uh, talked I, about. I, no, I good. think that could save a life. Yeah, no, I agree. Preaching to the That's choir. That's a good idea. Um, we've talked about putting that on the ATIS, and it really didn't go anywhere. I will definitely bring that up uh, to my boss and to the district and see what we can do about that. Another thing that I've talked to Denver Tracon, who is the overlying IFR facility, um, that when they're clearing a, an IFR aircraft inbound, uh, I personally think it's appropriate that they tell that aircraft when they switch them to us, radar service is terminated, contact NOCO tower. And yeah. they're, you know, to me, when I brought that up to the Tracon, it, it, the biggest thing it did for them or for us is that you told that pilot you are no longer getting radar services. Um, yeah. They kind of balked at it and we, you know, we did dueling paragraphs as far as let me pull out where I think the book says this and they pull out where they think the book says that and it, it really went nowhere. So yeah. sometimes I, I hit a I wall. Mean, but 
Yeah. And, and even if, um, uh, you know, like we, all of us mostly have iPads and ADSB and stuff is advisor quote unquote advisory information in order. To, and it really is helpful to know where to look outside the window to see and avoid. Um, can, can the tower be equipped with an iPad and an ADSB to at least give them advisory information? I'll and if they could, if, if they could, I, I will personally buy it for them. <laughs> no, ser the seriously, I will. Yeah, no, I, I've asked that question. I even, when I first got there, it's like, well, we have this swim data and I've got a ring camera at my house that I can bring up on my phone. Can't I just put a ring camera in front of it? And they're like, they're adamant that we cannot have something that's not certified, even though it's pretty darn accurate. If it's not certified, we are not allowed to have it in the tower. It's just even if it's quote I mean, unquote advisory, right? Yes, even though it's for situational awareness only, uh, the liability tackles come up, mm -hmm. and the answer is always not just no, but hell no. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I'm 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 sorry. I'm just speaking very passionately because I've nearly been killed twice. And uh, and I, I just want something to get pilots to wake up because, you know, you show the VFR chart and it might have a magenta dotted line versus a blue dotted line. Well, but the magenta uh, yeah, dotted line does not say we do or do not have radar. I know. It's, yeah. you know, nobody, nobody's paying attention to that. In, fr in fact, frankly, I don't think there's any publication I could find as a pilot that explicitly says uh, this tower has radar or this tower does not have radar. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, a lot of IFR pilots, they're getting handed off from center or approach to tower, and they don't know. In fact, the last guy that nearly collided with me, he was IFR, a Pilatus PC-12 coming in, and they switched him to tower, and he was supposed to be following me, but he followed a different plane yeah. and uh, visually and almost crashed. So, and the tower, the tower had no idea because, you know, four miles out, five miles out, the depth perception, they couldn't tell that we're right on top of each other. Right. So, so and I think, on uh, weather, just at least a warning to the pilots that, hey, it's still your responsibility. Keep your, your head on a swivel. Yeah, no, that's good. I will keep uh, having that conversation with the right people. And at a minimum, hopefully I can at least put it on the ATIS. Um, but yeah, we'll work yeah. on getting, we're, you, you can't imagine how many times a day we tell people IFR, VFR, corporate jets, private pilots, we don't have radar. We really need you to yeah. do what we're telling you to do. So Yeah, yeah, and I hear that a lot. And and uh, usually the we don't have radar is usually kind of a, a reactive response kind of after some right. conversation yep. versus yeah. proactively telling everyone. So I, I tell you, I would sleep so much better at night if we could just at least put on the ATIS a reminder because before people take off, and before people land at the airport, they listen to ATIS, reminding them that there is no radar. You right. still have to see and avoid. All right. Good so, idea. Sorry. I'll, Off my I'll, soapbox. I'll, done preaching. Thank you very much. Well, that's good. I will keep working that that issue. Dan, so. meanwhile, you have ADSB out and in. I have ADS, ADSB out and in, and we both have fast planes. Use it. That is saving oh, yeah. my tail many times. Yeah. Yeah. No, Howard, what, what saved my life was uh, my ADSB and, and four flight all of a sudden started squawking in my headset, yep. traffic, traffic, yep. traffic, 12 o'clock, close range, 300 feet. And yep. I pulled back my sunshade and I saw the greasy belly of a PC or uh, yeah, PC 12 descending down on top of me. When did you have your sunshade down for when you're supposed to see and avoid, Dan? And by the way, that's <laughs> happened down in the Denver area too. I, it's saved yep. my tail so many times. I hated it at first, but doggone, I've got my own radar out there and I'm going to use yep. it. It's my ADSB. So are there any other questions or comments? Hey, Dan, did that uh, PC-12 have uh, ADSB on board? Didn't they see you? Very very good question. I literally, uh, uh, once I settled down my rattled wife and pushed the plane into the hangar, I was heading to the FBO to talk to the pilot. And, uh, and as I was heading over there, I saw the PC-12 taken off. Uh, but he should have had T, probably TCAS with it being a turbine and right. uh, should have had ADSB. And I'm thinking, what the hell is he paying attention to? 
And he was just, it was, I looked up the tail number and it was a charter charter company and they're just kind of coming and going everywhere. So they have no local knowledge. Right. Well, we do have some PC-12s. Usually the, I want to say life flights uh, that come in pretty regularly, but I have no idea what equipment they have on board. Yeah. So that's pretty much all the talking I'm going to do unless you have uh, questions or comments. So I had a question as far as uh, like traversing the airspace. Do you guys right. manage the echo all the way to 18 or is there if, like if we wanted to overfly that airspace, is that do we need to talk to tower at all times? So there's two aspects of echo. There's echo surface area and echo airspace. We manage the echo surface area that's five mile radius around the airport up to 2,500 feet. So our field elevation is basically 5,000 feet. If you want to go higher than 7,500, if you if you call us at eight or 9,000, we will probably give you the blurb. We don't have radar. If you want better services, contact and approach. Um, you, we can't tell you yes or no because you're outside our airspace and uh, but I mean, if you call us and, and want to traverse at 7,000, yes, we will give you that authority. We will give you traffic advisories of what we know. Uh, you call us at 9,000. Uh, you can stay on our frequency for your comfort level if you want, but truthfully, you get better service with tender approach. However, they might, depending on how busy they are, they might not be able to handle you. Does that yep. answer your question? Yep, it absolutely does. Uh, I think that's uh, been a little bit confusing. Uh, I, I th This whole uh, conversation started because uh, I'm in a CFI chat group and we were talking about some of the rules around uh, the towered airports in a class echo. Right. So uh, a lot of hypothesize, a lot of hypothesizing going on. Well, if you ever want a different opinion, feel free to call me. I mean, I'm not the authority, but I've done this for a long time, and at least I know towered airspace quite well. Okay. What's the future look like? Um, part of that I probably can't talk about, but we will do more testing. Uh, like I said, the company has been told by the FAA to make some modifications. And the FAA is working on a standard that is good for any remote tower. I mean, there's it's surprising how many remote towers different airports around the nation want to start. And they're not all the same company that, that want to put them in. So the FAA is really just trying to put together a standard that says if you do this, it has to, you have to have these visibility uh, ability to, to to see with the cameras, you have to have, I mean, there's a whole list of things and and they're really working on making sure that the list is adequate so that when they have company A put it in versus company B that, that there is uh, uniformity in the service that the controllers can provide. And it's really, in my opinion, it's it's a growing learning. You know, I think they've got it dialed in some, but uh, will they change their mind again? I don't know. Um, and the company here is just really trying to to um, fit what what they have put in and modify it to where it fits the new requirement. It doesn't seem fair that hey, you changed the requirements, but I truly understand they're trying to make a standard that's good no matter where you put it, no matter what company is putting it in. And as long as you meet the standard and, and they're just trying, the FAA is just trying to make sure the standard is, is adequate, so. Hey Les, this is Mike Kosomniak. I was doing some reading reading today and I don't know if you can discuss it, but what role does AI have for this program. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, so um, um, there will be no um, self-driving air traffic control tower. 
Uh, that's not the point of it. The so point of it is, is people will be working the, air, the airspace just as if they were in a, a standard, you know, physical tower. Um, it really shouldn't change the rules. You're still talking to a person. The person's still making decisions based on, on known traffic and their ability to see that traffic whether they have radar or don't have radar. And that's one thing the FAA is trying to put together a standard that works whether you have radar in the tower or not. Uh, this tower will have, does have radar that it finally was installed. Uh, the final installation was just a couple, three months ago, four months ago, three months ago. So we have really nice radar in the remote tower. We don't have <laughs> anything in the mobile tower. Um, you know, then the whole cool concept of could we just put a person in the remote tower and and throw you know coordination over to the mobile tower? I mean that gets difficult in itself because now that's manning you know that's expectations for a person to just watch traffic when they're not responsible for the traffic. Uh, that opens a whole you know can of worms that needs to be addressed in itself. So right now we just work with what we can see out the windows. Okay. I believe um, one of our viewers just asked a question, are uh, tours of the remote facility available? Yes. Um, do you have my contact information? Feel free to, to, I'm okay with passing it out. If people want to call me and line something up, I can do that. Uh, Excellent. Preferably Monday through Friday, eight okay. to four or something like that. Mike, that might be a good event for us to set up just as a. Yeah. If you yeah. want, if you want a large group over the weekend, I'm I'm flexible. You know, okay. if I have enough enough early warning to change some things around, I can I can work that. Okay, I'll be in touch. Certainly. So Les Silent Howard again. You got a comment in the chat from a friend of mine who works out of Montrose, and I think she even brought a student along to or to this meeting to find out how to get to Fort Collins London but as long as you're prognosticating maybe you've been in meetings and so forth she wants to know if Montrose is going to get a remote tower and she asked me if Steamboat's going to get a remote tower there is interest out there do you have yeah. any idea when and how many places this is going to go so that is so far outside of my wheelhouse <laughs> uh, I can I can only speculate like you can speculate uh, but if you go to the CDOT website, those are airports that they list. Steamboat, Montrose, uh, you know, Telluride, Gunnison, Durango. I mean, all those airports. Now, it just ended up that Fort Collins used to be the busiest non-towered airport in the state. So that's where they started this project. Um, you know, you've been in the meetings where people at Fort Collins have said, well, once you start working out of the remote tower, can you work more airplanes in the pattern? And the, the true answer is, I don't know. This is a test facility. That's what we're testing. So could this be taken to Montrose? Sure. Will it? I don't know. That's what we're testing. And, and those decisions, nobody asked me. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a grunt when it all comes down to it. So Early on, there were high expectations. There were all sorts of small satellite airports around Omaha, around St. Louis, around any major airport, there's a satellite set, and the FAA would love to get a remote tower into those yeah, this project has, airports. This project has huge potential. Correct. And, and if COVID wouldn't have hit, where would we have been now without that? I, don't, I mean, light years down the road, but it did hit. All our all our worlds changed. That's true. Uh, Les, I was reading uh, online today, and I thought I read there was a remote tower located somewhere around Leesburg, Virginia. Not around Leesburg, in Leesburg, Virginia. That it, is it, the that was the first one that was put in. It's not been certified, but they are working air traffic control from the remote tower. Um, there's a lot of differences, uh, different company that put it in, different set of cameras, different, uh, I mean, everything's different. And the truth is, is if they had to meet uh, the new standard that the FAA came up with, they wouldn't, they'd have to modify. But, oh. but um, you know, 
they're not certified still, but, and I don't know how that works. You're not certified, but you still work in airplanes out of that. So, yeah. Okay. But yeah, Leesburg is one. They were talking about putting one up at uh, um, Haley, Idaho. I think that went away. They're talking about putting one in Alabama somewhere. Um, but these are just cities that are saying, we want to put this in our airport. And the FAA has nothing to know about it. it. It's like you could really put air traffic control anywhere as long as the entity, the city is willing to pay for it, the city or the state or a private company or whatever, but it mm -hmm. costs money. And if you want to, the FAA has very limited say so in it. Um, but if that's kind of why they're trying to put together this standard. Okay. Well, the other nice part about it is, is you can do flex towers where you know, one town might be busy from, you know, 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Right. It, it kind of backs off and you can, you can move additional people through different controller rooms. Yep. And see, that's really there. just less Habig speculating on what could be done. Right. Um, but I think that's, that would be a huge advantage. Uh, so the hardest part right now is bandwidth. Um, you know, we've got 31 cameras feeding how much it's it's a little more bandwidth than if you just want to stream Netflix on, at home. I mean, we've got a dedicated, I don't know if it's a T1 line, but it's still not enough to to take it anywhere that other than it's got to be hardwired from the cameras to to where we're reviewing it. Well, um, and it's and not just that, but you also have uh, a critical uptime. I mean, you can't not fail. Right. Right. So yeah. some advantages you have here. We have the stingiest cities in the world. They don't want to pay a penny to this airport. We have people, who, technical people from Colorado who are absolutely dedicated to make this work. We've got some pilots around here that are technically oriented. We'd like to see it work. If for nothing else, to say we did something in our lives that was useful, who knows? We've got air traffic controllers that will accept it. Now, I'm not going to speak for you as to whether you like it or not, but boy, you're doing a great job sitting in that trailer and waiting for this to come online. I think we've got the possibility of making this work if we can just work with the FAA, which, of course, is difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think the potential is super cool. It's, it's a neat project. I mean, when I retired from the FAA, uh, I grew up in Colorado, and my wife and I were moving back to be close to my mom. And before I retired, I was looking through my, some of my stuff and, and it's like, oh, there's a contract tower in Fort Collins. I made, sent one email and they're like, we're gonna put out a manager's bid, do you want it? And I'm like, uh, sure. I just wanted to be a controller, but so I, the project looked cool to me. And that's kind of what drove me to, to plug into it. You know, it's got huge potential. It's, you know, high cool factor well we appreciate having you here and i think you probably saved ann olson's life so there oh i didn't no somebody else might have so the engineer that put together adsp and his plane did that's for sure yeah. no four flights and adsp saved me there you go yep that one atc cannot take so we've got a few questions from the the chat uh, i just want to make sure, sure we get those for you um generally speaking how far distant can the controller see now I, i'd imagine that there's so it depends on type size of airplane you know if we're talking a citation 750 we can probably pick them out six or seven miles um you know a cessna 210 you know a lot of it depends on weather position of the airplane position of the sun you know are they coming in from the west where they're the mountains are the background are they coming in from the east is there haze in the sky you know if we're talking a typical blue sky colorado day relatively clear no wind um we can typically pick them up at out, out the window in the trailer um at four miles although i've had somebody call in from the northeast and a right down one renoy 33 report midfield they mm -hmm. report midfield downwind i'm looking out the trailer i'm like I don't see them. Granted, their midfield downwind was different than what I thought a midfield downwind should be, but 
you know, another 30 seconds later there, they popped up where I would expect a midfield downwind. But, you know, when that happens, you're I'm scanning, you know, a wide swath of sky trying to pick out a Cessna 172 or, a, or you know, an Ames Archer. And sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. Um, so it's, it's I, I can't say it's a definite number, but usually if you're within four miles, we, you know, the odds are good that we can probably see you. Could have been Wonder Woman's jet too. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, we, yeah. <laughs> that that was for a laugh. I mean, come on, everybody. <laughs> oh, good one. Should um, we turn on our lights, Wes? Always, always helps. Yes. And um, that is just a basic air traffic controller saying that. If you're flying into Centennial, turn your lights on. If you're flying into Colorado Springs, turn your lights on. Just always a good idea. Yeah. Um, another question is, is, do you have any rough data on how much traffic coming into FNL does not have ADSB, And are there plans to supplement remote towers with ADSB in lieu, lieu of radar? So we have no hard data. I could give you some, um, you know, just a ballpark figure that I think from, because as the manager, you know, I've got some administrative duties. Um, but I do spend a lot of time in the remote tower watching our controllers work just so as a you know, supervisor, keeping an eye on what they're doing, make sure they're doing the right thing at the right time. Um, but I have the ability when I'm doing that to look over at radar and I can look down at what we call the swim feed, which only picks up transponder equipped aircraft and ADSB aircraft. And it truly seems like... Um, if I were to throw a number, it's probably 60 to 75% somewhere in there of ADSB. Um, might even be 50%, but um, that would be just an educated guess from sitting in the remote tower watching traffic. Okay. Um, another question is, is the test similar to the trucking companies trying to drive the trucks remotely? No. Not at all. Okay. And it's nothing like Tesla trying to get a self-driving car. Okay. Um, can you please explain the depth perception for estimating plane distance visually through 2D screens on in a remote tower? Uh, it's really no different than visualizing it out the window. Um, you know, the, the clarity isn't uh, quite as good as as we would like it, but, um, you know, the, the idea of, you know, depth perception versus, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a learned skill, you know, knowing where a plane would be on a five mile funnel, you know, how far out he is, size of airplane, knowing it's a 172, knowing that if we have a 737, they're gonna look at a lot different at five mile final. I mean, taking all that into, it is an experience thing to where, you know, type aircraft, you know, where they should be, you know, what their, you know, what their attitude is. Are they really on final? Um, you know, from our perspective, it's still just a guess, but it, it's an educated guess, you know. When I sit in the remote tower and watch my controllers work sometimes, it's like, oh, you said four miles, he's really like three. That's not bad, you know. I think I think the controllers, you know, do a very good job. I almost wish there was a controller sitting in the remote tower when I'm working and they can give me feedback on how's my distances because I don't know. I, I never get that that feedback, but... I do that to the controllers. It's like, yeah, your distances are a little off or, or your distances were really good. Good job. So you don't have like a uh, um, a mouse that you can touch the, the the plane in the in the screen on the or on the screen in the air and to give you telemetry based on that. No. Okay. Now when we're in the remote tower, we have radar. We don't need to guess out the window. Oh uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the out the window is, you know, the primary responsibility for a tower controller is runway separation. 
So being able to scan the runway, make sure that we have the appropriate separation for an aircraft to land or take off, clear vehicles, clear debris even, um, you know, that's the primary, you know, as tower controllers, we say we work from the runway out. Runway is the, the main thing we work on, and then everything else is, is secondary. Now, they're just as important to make sure you issue traffic calls, sequencing, um, keeping them apart, you know, in our airspace is all important, but you cannot let the runway separation deteriorate. Okay. Um, let me see where we're at here. Uh, who controls the runway lighting when the tower is operational? The tower does. Sort of. So <laughs> <laughs> how do you like that answer? You can tell I work for the government, right? Yeah. So it's still pilot controlled lighting with your key in the mic. And um, as controllers, when it gets dark out, we key the mic, bring up the runway lights. Uh, now, if we are below VFR conditions and we need the lights set on so we don't want them to shut off every 15 minutes, we might call over to uh, Loveland Jet Center and say, turn on the beacon and can you turn on the runway lights and just keep them on until we say so. So they do have, there is a uh, runway control in the remote tower, but it's, and there's also a runway lighting control panel in the Loveland Fort Collins Jet Center, and they can key the panel at our request. But normal VFR night where it's dark out um, and we're still open, which only occurs for a few months, um, we manually work on keeping the lights on. And early on, I was like, I would look at the 15 minutes going, it's going to shut off soon. It's like, just key it again, just reset the timer. You know, sometimes you just got to figure it out because the last thing you want is the pilot to be on short final and the lights go off, which I've had happen, but live and learn. Yeah. So I know that doesn't really answer the question. The pilots control it, but the controllers have the same frequency to key it up. So, sure. Um, over the recent years, I've noticed a significant increased gap between traffic before any given VFR plane is cleared to depart. Is there something that is known? And more importantly, is it expected to improve with the remote tower? So I think it's a question regarding spacing. Spacing, yeah, spacing is difficult and it's gonna vary from controller to controller, you know, and it comes down to the, the visually seeing the aircraft out the window, is he on a mile final, is he on a mile and a half final? Um, you know, what I'm used to is you look at the radar, you know that you can beat the guy. Um, and, and then there's the concept that we have a lot of student pilots. Um, you know, we got Ames, we got the flying school, we got, you know, um, kind of, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, you're, you're shy to pull the trigger and get him out. You know, if if we had a pilot that we knew, you know, was good, would get to it, not just sit up, you know, get on the, you know, the runway and sit there, <clears throat> we'll clear him for takeoff. But it's, you know, it's a judgment call. I mean, I will never harp on my controllers for not hitting a hole that they could have possibly made. Um, and it's, you know, it's to the detriment of efficiency, but safety is always number one. And it's got to be the ability of each controller to be able to get them out. So. Yeah, I just want to jump in quickly on that. I respect the safety argument. I'm trying not to be a jerk, but sometimes it's egregiously bad. Yeah. I mean, I've sure. sat there for 15 minutes when there's like, you know, I say my airplane, I can accept an immediate departure. And they say negative. I've got to assess the 172 on a four mile final. You know, that's minutes away. It's yeah. very frustrating. So it's just a data point. You know, it's not like a minor thing that I couldn't get out of a marginal hole. It's like a major thing that I right. couldn't get out in an egregiously large hole, which strikes so if me. It's as ever as bad as you just described, feel free to give me a call and I will look at those. I mean, I can I can review, I can have discussions with my controllers, I can um, you know. And if it's different than what you see, I can get back to you and say, well, here's what I saw after the fact. So 
I have no problem reviewing um, any kind of situation that you think wasn't done as good as it could be. I mean, our goal is our controllers continually get better. Our system continually gets better. And, and the best way to do that is get feedback from pilots that we can actively review and look at and learn from each situation. So yeah, if you, if you have dates and times, I'm always willing to take it, look at it, listen to tapes. Like I said, we don't have radar in the horse trailer, but I can bring up a radar replay and know what it really was and have a discussion with my controller. So Fair enough. feel Fair free to very much. Feel free call me. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Good. Now I will say I've seen times that it's busy and people do sit on the ground. And could the controller have given the departure a higher priority than the three people in the pattern that have been doing touch and goes for a half an hour? Probably, yes. Should they have? Probably. Um, that's always a tough call though. You know, it's 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 a judgment call and and I really just defer to how did this did the controller feel safe doing it? Did they could they have done it a better way? I mean, we're constantly having those discussions. Is there a better way that you could have done this? Is there a more efficient way? Did we have to give higher priority to the touch and go traffic? You know, it's there is no cut and dry yes and no answer like that. And sometimes you're just gonna sit there because we're busy and I apologize, but that's life when we, we don't have all the tools that we need. So inside the, um, not the um, remote tower section, but the trailer that's sitting out there, because huh? that, that, that's where the most of the controllers, or that's where the controllers sit, correct? Right. Um, what type of equipment do they have in that trailer? Let me see if I can bring up a picture. Hang on. I know this took a while. But okay, did that, that picture changed yep. to where to the, the right? So this is a picture. Now it's old because this is the 2010 presentation. Um, but this is a picture inside uh, what we consider the tower cab. If you looked at the trailer with the four black windows, um, it's the, probably the person taking this picture isn't even standing in the tower cab. He's standing on the stairs to come in. There's room for two people. There's a local controller that sits here or stands here. There's a ground controller that sits or stands here. Uh, behind them over here is a supervisor's desk. Uh, well, not really. A, it's a counter with a, with a computer on it. Um, we have this right here is our flight data input output computer that we bring up by our flight plans. We have a printer, we have a phone, standby radio. These right here are our voice switching system. We have frequencies and landlines that we access through that. This is our ASOS uh, display to where we get all our weather. And this is radio equipment. That's it. And we have windows with shades. So not a lot of equipment, not a lot of room. If if you get a tower, a, a tour of this tower, um, you know, it's it's going to be snug, especially if there's two controllers up here working, it'll be snug. You know, if, if I'm given the tour, I won't even go up the tower. I'll go to you can go stand up next to them and and don't get too friendly with them. But it's yeah. There's tight quarters. There's not a lot of equipment. We, you know, it's very bare bones. You know, we have our weather equipment, our, our flight data and information, and our radios. And there you go. So on a nice day, they could grab the radio and uh, work on their tan outside, right? Um, <laughs> technically, yes. However... <laughs> You still have to be able to push the buttons in here. You still have to be able to see, you know, you know, it, it seems like a nice idea, but truthfully, I mean, I've taken a break and sat in a lawn chair outside and it's gorgeous and I love it, but, but practically speaking, being plugged in and working from there, um, you know, you've just put yourself, I don't right. know, five I feet lower, four feet lower. Um, 
you've, you've now cut out your visibility to see to the north of you. You've cut out your ability to see a lot of the sky. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I've never seen any controller here do that. Um, usually we've got enough staffing. We can give somebody a break. They can go work on their tan on their break on a lawn chair. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, the trailer, the remote trailers at Oshkosh that, uh, our spotters coming in. Oh uh, yeah. That would, that's, that's what, what I was sort of thinking of on that. Certainly. Um, but no, I, I, I would expect the professionalism of the, the controllers to realize that. So, yeah, I feel real lucky. We've got, you know, five controllers, uh, and myself, and they are all really good people to work with, you know, good experience, even the least experienced ones that, that, uh, are here, they've, they've learned the system and they they've grown and they do a very good job. I feel lucky to be able to manage people who, who really want to do good work here, and they do. I'm proud of them. Can one controller run all positions, and under what circumstances would that be allowed? So when it's slow, um, by the time we get three in the touch and go pattern, it's usually too busy to to have ground combined. Um, there's times so we open up at eight in the morning, we close at six at night. There's times at eight in the morning. I wish we had two controllers here, but there's one person who opens the tower. And usually we get we get there 15 minutes early. We have some paperwork, some administrative things to do. But every controller spends the the five minutes to 10 minutes prior to opening the tower, watching the airplanes, listening to the frequency, keeping track of what everybody's doing. So that as soon as the eight o'clock hour strikes, we are ready to jump on and you know, there's times there's four or five in the touch and go pattern. There's a bunch of taxiing out waiting to go. And um, yeah, sometimes you're just hitting the ground running and it, you're by yourself and you have to do it. Um, there's no choice in the matter. Um, but then as soon as the 830 controller shows up, you know, you split it off and, uh, you know, spread out the work a little, a little bit. But every every controller knows how to manage uh, the volume. And sometimes it's, you know, you might hear the words remain clear of the echo surface area. I'll call you back in five minutes or whenever I can let you come in. You know, that sometimes it's times like that, that, that you sit on the ground and, you know, because of staffing that we can't split the frequency. And, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And controllers manage that by typically slowing the problem down. Um, I, so I have a friend of mine that learned to fly at up at FNL. I have not experienced this myself, but do you run traffic patterns on each side of the, the runway or is it just left or right, depending upon how you're managing the flow? So I prefer the controllers to put the touch and go pattern uh, on the west side of the runway. If we're on 3-3, left traffic. If we're on 1-5, right traffic. There was a time period that we couldn't simply because we hadn't crossed the T's and dotted the I's for the safety management system to show that we can do something other than what's published, but we've done that. We can go back to, to right traffic on 1.5. And the advantage, if you look at this picture with the tower, you have the runway here. So we want our controllers to face the runway when they're working. And if the downwind is on the east side, it's behind them. And so that's problematic if it's the touch and go pattern and it's the bulk of what you're doing because you're constantly turning around. Once you put the downwind traffic for the touch and go pattern on the west side of the runway, now you're facing the runway, you're facing your downwind, you're facing your traffic. Granted, there is gonna be stuff coming in from the northeast that you give a right downwind for runway 33 and you do have to turn around and find them. but it, it makes it so much smoother and, and simpler if we keep our local traffic pattern on the west side of the runway. I see. Okay, so that explains. Uh, I, I, that always confused me because I was like, I wonder how they're doing that, but I, I just hadn't experienced it. We had a controller come that was temporary for the phase one testing <clears throat> that got pushed back. So, so that controller never actually worked 
the phase one, but they would um, um, not really care left or right downwind, make right or light, right or you know right or left tra close traffic, whichever you want. And almost every controller was like, "Oh no, we don't want we don't want that. We need them on the west side." And and for the most part, that's that is the the order that they get from the manage, manager is put the touch and go traffic on the west side of every runway. So it's just, it's safer, it's better, more efficient, less conflicts, fewer conflicts. So I fly out of Metro and uh, they're dealing with noise complaints quite a bit. Um, does Fort Collins have a fairly high level of uh, noise complaints up there? Um, you'd have to talk to the airport. I think they're the ones that get the noise okay. complaints. There are some, but uh, I wouldn't say they're high. No. Okay. Yeah, no. they're 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 well located. So. Um... Yeah, we're not located like like Jeffco. And I apologize. I'm probably too old school to call it Rocky Mountain Metro. No, it's no. Just, I I. I just tell you when that change made, and I'm like, I just couldn't. It's like. Clear to the airport for my known as Jeffco. I don't know. What's I, started, really? I started flying when that transition took place. So I was already kind of in Metro mode, but um, I, I, I mean, I don't get offended by it. There you go. So there's been a lot of discussion about 1533, but we have another uh, runway. We have another runway. I'm glad you brought that up. So 99% of the time that runway is used as a taxiway. Um, it's 2,200 feet, 2,198 I think is the distance. It's not certified to circle uh, off of any approach. It's, uh, it's not lit, so it's not really usable at night. Uh, I suppose there's no prohibition to using it at night if you have landing lights, but not a great idea. Um, so, the only time I've seen it used uh, is a helicopter doing touch and goes practice. Is Tabria wanting to to practice a little bit on on you know a shorter runway, or if we have a high wind and we're talking twenty knots or greater, and and it's a direct crosswind to to one five or three three, and so they need it. Um, but for the most part, uh, Ames Community College is parked at the at the east end of that runway. There's several corporate jets that are parked over there. <laughs> you know what the number is, whether it's 99% or a little lower than that. It's a high percentage of its usages as a taxiway. But yeah, you can ask for it. Um, if we can accommodate it, we can give it to you. But if we don't have a high crosswind and it's, we can't really justify it for safety and we're busy. We might deny the request and say one five is the active runway. That's what you get. Um, but if we're slow and you want to try it, feel free to ask. Okay. Yeah, I've used it several times in the last year. Yeah. Um, not always because of wind, but that has been on a couple of occasions that's been the case. Yeah, and if you, I don't know where you park, but if you park down that east side, then I've I've seen people land because that's where they park. No, I park clear around where most of the tees are. Okay. But I, um, having, having spent a lot of time out in Oregon recently and landed on shorter runways, prefer to keep that skill. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with asking. And we will, if we can accommodate it, we'll allow it. Cool, thanks. You bet. All right, so we've got another question here. Um, how should traffic enter the pattern on the west side of the runway when coming from the east? Do you have a traffic? Uh, do you have traffic fly a midfield entry or have traffic fly around? Uh, or is it up to the pilot on how they enter? Are you uh, talking when the tower is closed or when the tower is open? Um, I'm going to I'm going to guess that it's with the tower open. Yes, it's with so the tower. The open. tower open, we will assign a pattern entry. If you're inbound from the east, um, most likely we will not have you enter to the west. You know what I mean? We won't have you overfly to enter uh, 
uh, right downwind for one five. We won't have inner overflight inner left downwind for three three. If you're inbound from the east, it'll be inner midfield right downwind for three three or inner midfield left downwind for one five. Um, sometimes there has been some confusion. Title to call up, say I'm inbound from the west, we'll give them left downwind for three three and and it ends up going, no, I'm flying to the west. I'm actually inbound from the east. I mean, that happens. You know, it's just a clarity thing. But in general, we won't we won't give you a overfly the airport. <laughs> now I know when we, when I was at Centennial, we did it all the time. We had local too busy. Um, somebody calling from Chatfield, want to full stop, fly overfly the field and a right down one runway three five right. You know, just because that controller can't handle you. And that's the best way to get you out of their way. So, but here at Centennial, I'm sorry, here at whatever airport I'm at, NOCO, uh, we won't do that. Now, I will say if we're closed, then that probably isn't appropriate. If we're closed, all runways are published left traffic. If we're on 3-3, on three, three, when, or if the runway, there is no we're on, if we're closed and you want to land 3-3 three, three, the and you're inbound from the east, the appropriate is overfly the field in a left downwind. Um, but that's not something that I'm ever going to monitor or ever going to care about how you do because we're closed. Anything else? Any other questions? Got a number of thank yous, so yeah, well, definitely been very you. helpful because uh, I, I work when I'm flying into Fort Collins because it's uh, definitely something that I do. Um, I try to give the controllers as much latitude and uh, information as I can to be helpful and make their right. job easier. Because you I know, know my yeah. my opinion is we are a team, pilots and controllers. Yep. We will help you guys out, you know, the occasions that you're not doing quite the right thing. And we would like to think that you will help us, us out when we're not doing quite the right thing. No one here is perfect. Pilots are controllers. And we all need to look out for each other. And we all need to make sure that what we're doing is the safest. So thanks for inviting me. This is, this is a great avenue to put out information and get feedback. Thank, thank you, Les. That was uh, excellent. Very good. Yeah. Yeah.